I'm Brian Crabtree, housedog.com real estate show, Monday, April 29th, 2024. Here we go. Has Wall Street picked up the housing business and ran off with it? In other words, has the housing business become backstopped and controlled by Wall Street? I'll tell you how that affects you. Uh, and what the information is on that coming up, plus curmudgeons of information. It's how ignorance becomes more mainstream. People get upset at information they don't like. A little bit of fun today. Plus, where in the country are sellers slashing home prices? The answer may shock you. And Save Shim Creek, a decade-old Mount Pleasant organization purportedly to save Shim Creek from a parking garage, has cost the city millions of dollars. What's the latest on that? Yours truly had some involvement in that uh, early in the process. <laughs> Florida real estate. Florida real estate is seeing a slashing of prices. Uh, you know, if you look at condo sales in the Florida market, there are a lot of stories floating around out there about how you know, condo prices are starting to reduce, especially places like Miami and Tampa and places where there's dense amount of apartments and condos in the air. They're starting to have to discount those to sell it. Plus, there's a report from Redfin on the Gulf of Mexico side of Florida. For instance, Cape Coral and North Point has had a 50% year-over-year jump in inventory. It's starting to get to, as this says on your screen, uncomfortable levels. Uh, North Port, Sarasota saw homes for sale rise 48 percent and and we're really seeing this across the country the question becomes a, a function of demand when there was a thousand homes for sale in the charleston market there was probably two or three thousand people worth of demand each month and so we were hitting numbers in the two to three thousand range we just weren't keeping up with the inventory so what we have in charleston is a lot of people sitting on the sidelines a lot of people have been shoved to the sidelines in charleston meaning that the price points uh, anywhere within a 30-minute drive to their workplace are uh, uncomfortable and unaffordable. And so what's happened in Charleston is we have a backlog of demand that we weren't able to meet, either through building or pricing or homes available. And so what's happened here is that we've seen prices continue to rise in the face of all of these, I'd call them hammers of real estate value, uh, the hammering of uh, interest rates going up. Uh, the inflationary aspect of just the cost of homes driving up the cost of new homes, thus bringing up a rising tide lifts all boats, bringing up the price of homes uh, for the average home purchaser from your standard builders. Okay, so there's this now, and this explains some of the problems in places uh, across the South, like Charleston, Atlanta, Charlotte, Nashville, etc. Wall Street, since the crash around 2009, has been buying what I think equates to millions of homes. I did some research on this before the show today, and it looks like that the last count of available data about a year ago is that Wall Street owns 1.3 million homes across the country. I personally think the number has to be triple or quadruple that just by my math and some of the markets that I've been paying close attention to and the thousands and thousands of homes they own in single markets like Atlanta and here, it would appear to me that the actual number might be two to four million homes are owned by some private equity, Wall Street-based, or institutional type of arrangement. Um, the Wall Street, uh, the article in uh, Wall Street Journal today, you're seeing the headline of it, Wall Street has spent billions buying homes. A crackdown is looming. The sub-headline there is the important one. Lawmakers say investors that scooped up hundreds of thousands of houses to rent out are driving up home prices. Well, we've got a kind of a, a bunch of things going on. Let's look at this number first to quantify this information. Let me zoom this in. This is from uh, recent home purchase made by institutional home buyers. These are the main institutional home buyers throughout the country from Tiber Capital, who has a 2.3% rate of portfolio expansion. They bought 165 homes in the last three months, 696 homes purchased by Amherst, and the numbers go you know, up and down from there. Uh, but you can see on the right column in a market where many cities like Charleston 
have a lack of affordable homes that there are still not not in Charleston specifically, but across the regions, these private equity firms are buying homes. They're still picking up uh, thousands of homes per year at the rate that they're going, which is much needed inventory for the end user, first time and second time move up home buyer. This is one of the major problems with the marketplace that we're in. Is it's not just that we have less building going on than we need to keep up with household creation, let alone structural obsolescence, fires, floods, natural disasters, and the reduction of housing stock, which is a couple hundred thousand homes per year on average that we're losing out of the housing stock. And then we need to be building about 1.6 million homes to keep up with the uh, the, the number of people that are out there right now uh, in household creation on the annual basis minus the number of homes that have been destroyed. So 1.6 million, we're actually at 900,000 to a million. And one of the issues with the housing stock is we're building plenty of homes at a million and higher or right there at the, at the million mark. But the available inventory in desirable areas within a reasonable commute to most of the, of the jobs of the marketplace, especially in Charleston, there's not a lot of new construction. Most all of it is in Somerville and the outlying areas of the, of the, new, the new Somerville, if you will. Uh, much of the uh, uh, area in, in, in Mount Pleasant, you find a new home here, you're starting at minimum in the 800s. Usually 1.1, 1.2 is the new construction starting point in Mount Pleasant, and it goes uh, exponentially up from there. If you look in Charleston, you have to go south to Ravenel to get before $400,000 in price in terms of new single-family construction just to touch on John's Island. And so what you end up having is you've got uh, very few options within a 45-minute commute to most of the jobs. And that then keeps driving up the prices of, of a place like Charleston. These private equity firms have bought up a lot of real estate. So what, what might happen here? Uh, there might be some taxation pressure. There might be some otherwise investment pressure on these firms by lawmakers because what's happening is that these buyers have come into markets, these equity firms. They, they pay cash. They've paid, in most cases, top dollar. Uh, I used to have them in Atlanta. Uh, not as much here in Charleston because of the price point we work with here, but in Atlanta, if you listed a three hundred thousand dollar home, you know between two thousand sixteen and twenty twenty one, even today, um, you would have four or five of these private equity firms offering on it, and anybody with an FHA loan, VA loan, standard, you know, bunch of contingency situation loans. They just couldn't win the bid because the cash buyer, the Wall Street money, would outbid them. This has really created a um, I, if it weren't real, I'd call it artificial. Uh, it's artificial in terms of what we have historically experienced in housing. Never have we had this large scale of a of a institutional level of purchasing of single family homes, and they're making it work by by all intents and purposes. Especially when you look at the age of their portfolios, they have contributed to driving up the prices of housing across many parts of the country. Just like Wall Street can artificially get excited about a stock like I don't know Tesla, and it shoots way up into the hundreds of dollars, and now it's a pittance of that amount, or any of these bumps we see in Wall Street. So some of what's happened in housing is a big function of Wall Street getting involved in the housing market at an ownership level. They're buying our stock, your stock, my stock, the everyday guy's stock, everyday girl's stock of houses. Like That used to be kind of the last bastion of individual home investment, right, or, or equity investment by average people in the country. Well, now Wall Street's poured in and made it unaffordable for average investment because the average person can't take out a 7% loan even with 20% down and make a 6% cap rate on a house work. Like if it, when you were seeing homes rent that were $300,000 for three grand a month, then you could turn nearly a double-digit return, and interest rates are 3 or 4%. How many can I buy, right, was the question. This is great, but now those same homes are 500000 and the rates are 7%, even if they come down a little bit. So the numbers and the math aren't working. So what's left? Well, you've got entire communities. There's one in Somerville right now that are being built as single-family homes. And they're being put up for lease for twenty two, twenty four, twenty five hundred dollars a month. In Nexton, they've got this, and Nexton's a very popular neighborhood. And a similar house in Nexton would be four and a quarter, four fifty, maybe even five hundred thousand. Well, it's leasing for less than half. 
proportionate to the sales price that we were getting for these houses just three or four years ago. So the average person goes up there and says, well, I want to buy a house as an investment property. Well, you got to pay four fifty for it, and all you're getting is twenty five hundred dollars a month. That math doesn't really work. It's too much risk for too little reward. So you have a pressure that's beginning to build that recognizes by lawmakers and local governments that these these big institutional Wall Street investors have bought up a bunch of houses, and now uh, we have an inventory crunch, and it's artificially driving up prices. I don't really know why the government cares. Because I don't think stopping the free investment or free investment into real estate is a great idea by any governmental party because it has so many unintended consequences. But I suppose the, the benefit of bad government policy uh, in that particular case, if any kind of measures were put in place to slow down this institutional purchasing and development and investment into single-family houses would be that it would return some of the opportunity to us. My fear, however, is, is that if they had to start selling all this inventory, suddenly the prices would come down, which would be good for those people who've been uh, priced out of the market, but not so good for those people who've been investing in the market based on the market that exists now. So we'll see. We're going to follow this story, and I'll keep you up to date on my Facebook pages and my blogs and my uh, video show here as to what happens uh, as we go forward. There was one other, I did show the graph, which had all the houses that are being bought. So this is a huge part of the market that we have now. Uh, the thing that's amazing to me is that we built this market and this price dynamic that we have right now on three to three and a half percent interest rates. And as rates have doubled, literally, We've only seen the amount of appreciation slow down, which indicates to me that even if we're in a bit of a lull right now, which I think it's gotten a little soft, a little mushy, the real estate market, even some parts of Charleston uh, in the higher side, you know, the average price is still gangbusters. But in the higher side of prices, I, I think we've hit some resistance, if you will. If we want to look at it from a Wall Street standpoint, like a stock meets its ceiling of resistance. I think real estate's hit that number, especially in places like Mount Pleasant right now. But if rates fall a point, I'm not sure that it doesn't forge ahead even more. So here's when to buy a new house. If you're trying to think about all this, like, okay, that's great. Rates are high. Prices are high. Our price is going to come down. Doesn't look like it. Jobs are great. Demand is up. You know, there's lots of people on the sideline. If rates come down, prices will go up some more. When, when do I buy a house if I'm thinking about buying? Well, you shouldn't base your decision solely on what's happening in the market. It's important. Like if you just can see it's a bubble, which I don't think it really is, but if it just looked like a bubble and there was a lot of speculation and flipping going on, then you would know that this is a very unhealthy market. There would be a big question mark over the market. That's not really what's happening. What's happening right now is a lot of people want to live in the Charleston area and we don't have enough houses. So prices are going up and uh, they're only going up very slowly or not at all at this point, if that's the case, because uh, rates have gone up some. So what really is important is your timeline. And so if you are thinking you're going to move into a house and in three years flip it and make a huge profit, um, now might not be the time to time that out. But if you're thinking, I'm going to live in this house for at least five years, maybe 10, then trying to figure out the market doesn't really matter. Get in, get in the game. Um, and, and the worst case scenario is if you hit a market lull when you go to sell, it gets a little dull, a little soft. You just wait till the other side of it. It's unprecedented what we saw in 2008 and 19, and unlikely we're going to see that again. And you have to ask yourself this question. I'm someone in the real estate sales business, but also in the mortgage business. So do you really want a mortgage? And if you do, what kind of mortgage do you want? So a lot of people, and one of the problems with the market now, is a lot of people have a house. Maybe they've got um, you know, a house they paid 200000 for, and it's worth 500000 now a few years later. They've got, they took a refinance for 200000 at 3% interest. They're paying uh, $500 a month in interest, and they're looking at uh, getting the house of their dreams, and that's a million one, right? And so you take all that equity and you put it down, and now exponentially your payment goes up. Or you're going to downsize uh, and you can pay cash or barely pay cash, but now you still need a $100,000 mortgage. Well, at six and three quarters or 7%, your mortgage is going to be almost as much on the new house as the one at three and a half or 3% interest. So that creates a real problem for some people. What I don't think a lot of people think about, though, is that sometimes the rates are a little better 
with a smaller down payment and you just pay mortgage insurance. So you might put that 20% down, you save on mortgage insurance, but sometimes they don't actually, re- the rate might be a little higher. The points and fees might be a little higher. So you could put five or 10% down and buy a new primary resident at today's lovely interest rates. I say that jokingly, but you've got such a low rate on that house you had that you paid 200,000 for that's worth five or 600,000 and your mortgage all ends like $1,000, 1100 a month, or maybe you got 2000 a month, right? But you can get an extra two grand per month for that over and above everything it costs you to own the home, including the payment in rent, right? So you take that two grand and that almost fully subsidizes by keeping your old interest rate and your old home. And you use that to subsidize the super high rates that are in the market now. And then you have an investment that continues in theory to go up in value and a new home, which I don't call investments, it's a liability, but it can act like an investment by going up in value while you have a really nice, desirable dream home to live in, right? So there's, there's a formula for this. And sometimes you can find that by keeping your old super low, oh my God, I can't believe I got that rate, rate mortgage, right? You can subsidize with that the purchase of what you want next and maintain the same interest factor, meaning that once you merge all that together, instead of paying 7% on the new mortgage, you're paying the equivalent after the income from the old one of three and three quarters of 4%. This doesn't work for everybody, but it, it, it kind of does work. And by the way, when you're, the question we're answering here is, when is a good time to buy a house, right? So it doesn't matter what the interest rates are. Debt is debt. You have to pay it back. So it's about what can I afford each month? And what's happening right now is people are saying, oh, well, well, I could buy that million and a half dollar home on the Tidal Creek, and now I'm getting a million and a half dollar home or a million dollar home or $1.2 million home now looking at someone's backyard, right? So this is weird. So things have gotten harder, more expensive to purchase, but yet prices continue to go up because demand's there and inventory's low, demand high, inventory low. So this sucks. (laughs) I mean, that's what a lot of buyers are saying. This is depressing. It sucks. Well, it does if you're a buyer. But you got to become an owner at some point to get in the game and not have it suck as much, right? So it sucks to have to make that payment and to not get all the home you could have gotten a couple of years ago. But it also would suck to wait five years waiting for the market, when you could have been paying down, in, uh, getting the tax deduction on the interest, paying down the principal every month that you make a payment, and gaining the equity, which we expect to be on the average home, which is about four or five hundred grand, eighty three thousand dollars, according to the Association of Realtors survey, which I, I think is a generally reliable uh, research project. Um, eighty three grand. That's uh, that's a few percentage points a year, which in theory negates all your interest. So it's about, can I afford the payment? And how much debt and payment am I comfortable having for an extended period of time? Because a lot of people go, oh, I'd love to have this house with the dock and the three-car garage and all the bells and whistles and the pool and boom, and it's two million, but I really should be at a million too. And then three or four years, you realize you haven't swam in the, swam in the pool because you're too busy working to pay that mortgage. I don't like to put people in that stuff, so I, I try to help people uh, analyze um, exactly how to come about the best scenario. All right, let's uh, minimize me and go to another screen. Uh, so we've got uh, a issue that I have been intimately familiar with, ended up in part of this lawsuit many years ago. Uh, I can't believe this is still going on. Uh, the original Save Shim Creek, I vehemently p- uh, opposed, not because I want them to ruin Shim Creek, but because, first of all, I think the story behind the millions of dollars that it's now cost Mount Pleasant and the Save Shim Creek story is, uh, is, a, is a shame because it was a lie to begin with. This, this was a parking garage with three stories of office building and a couple of stories of parking. Uh, it's right next to... Uh, uh, Oh, gosh, I can't remember the name of the restaurant, but uh, the French restaurant off of Coleman Boulevard and right in front of Saltwater Cowboys. So it's not exactly on Shim Creek, but it's right next to it. If you've been there, you've seen it. You've probably parked in this garage, potentially, if you've eaten at some of the Shim Creek restaurants. 
But after it was already approved, already plans, already contracted with the developer to do this partnership with the city of Mount Pleasant back in the Linda Page days as mayor, um, the, this group called Save Shim Creek came out and says, we want to stop this, right? And then there was this guy that worked for the company that did some of the original planning, and then he got fired, and then he sued me, and I can't talk about that any further but because uh, we settled out of court. Uh, and then he went on at the at the state level to appeal and appeal and appeal his firing, and eventually, as I understand it, with the Supreme Court lost. And he was the leader who started Save Shim Creek. And then he became city council for Mount Pleasant, and the mayor that's there now in Mount Pleasant, Will Haney, was all part of this group in some fashion. And basically what they did is they came into Mount Pleasant, they said, now we're here to stop development, and it's our town, and you people don't matter. If you hadn't been here your whole life, we don't care what you think. And this was the general messaging of this group, right? And, and like, I, I, I have come around to some of their thinking in terms of we need another apartment complex in Mount Pleasant, like we need a hole in the head and we don't need these major brick monstrosities. It's not the kind of town. We don't have the infrastructure for it. So I get some of their concerns, and those are being manifested. They have legitimate concerns they always have. The problem is you can't stop something the city has already had under contract. So when you look at this thing here, uh, there's a $2.6 million in damages that were ruled. Um and that uh, has been accruing interest, and they think the interest rate, according to Channel 5, Live 5 News, has already gone to $1.2 million because they keep appealing, and they've appealed twice and lost the city of Mount Pleasant. The city of Mount Pleasant is paying $1,500 a day to uh, uh, pay interest unless they get this overturned and this judgment's no longer valid, which is very unlikely because this is a city uh, issue, and, and we've spent, as a city, millions of dollars on this thing. This is where a bunch of people came together, didn't know what they were talking about, created a group, Save Shim Creek, had a legitimate concern, and manifested and forged just like any other political action committee or political group. They made a bigger mess out of their cause than if they had focused on what they could control, like master plans and planning and zoning and things to keep more of these types of projects. If this is not what the city wants and this is not what the people want, great, let's stop it. Let's create a master plan and say these undeveloped areas, this is what we would like to see here. They don't do that. They wait. They don't get involved. Something starts going vertical. They throw a fit, get everybody stirred up. And then the city pays millions and millions of dollars in legal fees and judgments because we try to breach contracts. So we've elected people in Mount Pleasant over the last decade. This issue started really hot and trot, hot to trot in 2013. We've elected people in the last decade that have tried to take people's properties for eminent domain simply to keep them from being developed. That got overturned, obviously, by the courts, who have tried to undo contracts that were legal and binding between the city and developers and who have tried twice to appeal the loss of such a, a judgment to try to keep the city from having to pay. And these are all the people we keep electing that have subjected us to these failed policies. Meanwhile, if you look around Mount Pleasant, while they're trying to stop development, there's been more of it than ever. It's the most maddening thing I've ever seen in my life. There's been more development than ever since Save Shim Creek <laughs> tried to stop a damn parking garage, right? And I have had the privilege and the dis, dis, dishonor of being sued for my opinion over this and then settling. Won't talk about that. Other than to say that everything I predicted in the initial broadcast on Charleston Radio on this has turned out to be true. People who weren't telling the truth, people who had an interest in some form of the profits from this, who chose not to decide uh, or to disclose that, the fact that people had political aspirations and wanted to run for political office. I made that statement. I was called every name in the book. Well, it was sort of like this. This is, a, this is another uh, completely different subject about growth in Charleston. I want to show you. This is the kind of Facebook commentary that I got. Not This is co totally unrelated, but from Save Shim Creek members over the course of all that time, while this was a big news story for a couple of years, is hatred. And they would try to discredit anything I said. Daniel here puts on my Facebook page about my article that talked about the, the f potential growth in Charleston. Let's look at the top. The potential growth in Charleston, you see right at the top here, population 1.5 million was the question, right? 
He says 153,000 is the Charleston population, 100,000 is Mount Pleasant, 800,000 total in the Tri-County. You have zero experience talking to me here. Never a top producer. WTF, do you know? 1.5 million population. Where the, and then dirty word, did you pull that from GTFOH, get the you know what out of here, right? So this is a typical individual, which I call curmudgeons of information. They see information they don't like. They see details about a parking garage that's going to be built no matter what. It's already contracted. And they vomit all over Facebook and wherever it is their ignorance because they didn't get involved and follow what's going on and, and be proactive. And, I, you know, I still get it to this day on the content because this shows me, and what I said to the guys, he didn't watch the video. The question at the top of this page for this nasty comment uh, of, of vulgarity uh, about me is uh, Charleston population 1.5 million question mark, right? There's the question mark right there. So that's the question. And then, of course, he goes into the process of, um, you know, bashing, right? Community bashing. And um, same thing happened with the parking garage. Listen, folks, the, the population of Charleston by the year 2040 at the current rate of growth, which we see no reason it's going to stop, is going to reach 1.5 million. What do we want that to look like? Do you think we're going to stop it? Maybe it slows down. Maybe it's 1.2 million. How does it look now at 800,000, 850,000, right? How does it look now? It's pretty congested. It's pretty harsh. Sometimes it's really hard to get around, and, and at times it's Atlanta. The only difference in Charleston traffic and Atlanta traffic is Atlanta's rush hour starts at noon and ends at 7, and in the morning starts at 6 and ends at noon, right? And maybe there's 30 minutes in the middle that there's no rush hour. Charleston's rush hour is equally as bad as Atlanta's. It's just maybe two or three hours in the morning and two or three hours in the afternoon. It hasn't closed the gap of the clock yet, but it's coming. So what are we going to do about it? You know, what, what are we going to do in Charleston? We need a master plan, and we need a plan for the growth the way we want it. Like, we're sick of apartment complexes. That's okay. No more institutional money pouring in. If you want to build a multifamily residential space, it's got to be condos. Otherwise, maybe we need more offices or retail or community amenity type support. You know, do we want to put in more parks to create green space and save land? You know, what, does the city want to spend a few million buying up some land to develop? into amenities for the residents or do they want to keep spending millions of dollars paying developers for which a bunch of idiots tried to you know breach contracts you know where do we want to invest our money it's the question is not am i stupid and i'm not a top producer and all this garbage this guy just said all right right ignorant it's the question is one and a half million, what's that number in relation to Charleston population projection of population by 2040 what are we going to do about it how are we going to grow smartly? Or are we just going to keep exploding bombs off in forest, building dense retail with no planning of roads? I think we're headed toward the latter. I hope we come up with a better plan and we stop keyboard assaulting people who are talking about the general problem and some potential solutions. Uh, talking about solutions, if you have the problem that you need to sell your home to get somewhere else or to get another one, I will solve it very quickly. If you'll give me a call at 843-343-4141 or visit my website, housedog.com, you can check your home's equity. Get a home equity checkup by going to lowcountryequity.com. That's lowcountryequity.com. It'll take you right to the address bar. Start typing in your home's address. And it'll start indicating a value. Once you do that, not selling your information, trying to make your phone ring off the hook, I will offer you a free full-blown comparative market analysis, which will give you an exact value you can almost take to the bank of your home if you'd like it. Uh, you can get that by emailing me to brian at housedog.com. Have a great week. Thanks for watching.